Victoria. A stunning okay. performance, dominating Victoria as a ring guy. My next guest holds the third most wins in Ohio State University tennis history. He is known for his inspiring paintings that are displayed around the world. He travels far and wide to share his story. But today, he is my guest on this episode of Think About It. He is Jeff Spar. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to Think About It Season 2. I'm so excited to talk to you, to get to know you. And I've been reading a lot about you, so I can't wait to start our conversation. Well, thank you, Vika. An honor and a pleasure uh, to join you. I'm a big fan and uh, appreciate all the great stuff you're doing out there. So, Thank you. I know you are in Rhode Island, and it's one of the places that I hope to make it one, uh, one year after my career to be in the beautiful Hall of Fame. Um, so I'm looking forward to... To, to achieve that. I hear it's a very beautiful place. It is that, and we, we live in Newport in the summer, so when you do get in, inducted to the Hall of Fame, I look forward to it. It'll be the second time I've, I've hosted a, a party the night before when Bud Collins was inducted mm -hmm. the night before. We had a party oh, wow. in our home for him, so you'll be the second. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I read a lot about you. I read a, a lot about what you do, and it's very correlated with mental health. It's basically why you started, you know, your artistic journey. I just wanted to, um, for you to walk me a little bit through it. I know you started with tennis. So can you really like go back a little bit yeah. to uh, the beginning of your journey? Yeah, I'd love to. And, uh, you know, it's uh, even, even I can't believe my story sometimes when I, when I, when I tell it. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, my, my, I think my story is, is interesting only in that, you know, I could be anybody, you know, similar to the, the cause I've, I've dedicated my life to. But, you know, everybody has a story. And as, as you said, it's wonderful to see the, the world finally starting to listen, you know, to, to these stories uh, and the impact and the role, role it plays. But, you know, my the quick background on, on myself is, you know, I grew up here in Rhode Island. You know, went to prep school. I was a, I have to, I was going to say I was a really good tennis player, but then I got to realize who I'm talking to. So, <laughs> you know, so I got recruited by Ohio State and my junior year, I'm, I'm 20 years old playing at Ohio State, living out my dream, of, you know, playing division one in tennis. And, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, my mind was being overtaken by these, these terrible intrusive thoughts. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. Did you did you want to go pro or your mission was more into education? And, and yeah, well, my, my, as far as athletically, my goal was to play major division one sports and go on scholarship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that wasn't my goal or, or my, my capabilities. Uh, but, you know, there I am you know, living out my dream and I have no idea what's going on. And, you know, I was scared and, uh, and lonely. Right. And there was no one, you know, no one to talk to. You know, I, I couldn't talk to my teammates. You know, they think I was nuts. You know, I couldn't talk to my my coach. He'd probably bench me. Uh, and, you know, I couldn't talk to, you know, my parents. I didn't want to burden them with, uh, and I didn't know what, what was going on. There was no mental health services, even in a school like Ohio State, you know, in the mid-1980s. So, you know, and, and you probably can appreciate, like any good athlete, I, you know, I sucked it up and got worse, which is not a yeah. good thing to do. And, you know, I, I came back home after I graduated and was working in my family's business. And by the time I was 23, you know, I literally thought I was going crazy. And, uh, but, you know, somehow I found the courage and found my way to a, uh, a psychiatric hospital and was diagnosed with OCD, um, after a familiar obsessive compulsive, you know, disorder. And, you know, basically now for 30 some odd years, I've fought a debilitating illness that, that in, impacts me, you know, every day of my life. But, you know, it all looks good on, on the outside. You know, I've often said, you know, to your point, you know, I've always considered mental health uh and the stigma around it to be maybe one of the last great social issues in the world that we haven't got our hands yeah. on and my answer has always been the same invisible misunderstood and you can't talk about that's a tough combination you know so yeah. that's half the story and then you know the other the part of the story is the, what you can't make up i'm coming home from work one day and and somebody you know calls me and says that painting might be good for me and i had never mm -hmm. painted a day in my life but, you know, yeah. when you're desperate, you know, you'll try anything, yeah. anything. you know, so yeah. I, I rerouted, went to the art supply store, you know, came home and you can see by this jacket on the, on the, the, the Forrest Gump 
of painting. Yeah. I, I never stopped. And, you know, creativity and, and, and art literally changed the course of my life. You know, it gave me a, a sense of control that, you know, um, all mental illnesses, you know, rob you of. And um, it was invigorating to my soul, gave me peace of mind. And I was pretty good at it. That was the shock. This awareness, and then when it comes, I guess, from public person as well, it, it people listen more, which I understand, and at the same time, not because being a public person doesn't make you more or less of a person. It just makes you maybe more particular in in a skill that you have. But we all go through, you know, through the same things, through the same struggles, and the worst part, I would say, from it is that it's invisible. I so saw on the internet where they take pictures of of people like Robbie Williams and you know a comedian who who make people laugh and is always joyful and the photos were of happy people that unfortunately you know had uh, committed suicide and you understand that this particular illness is so invisible and one of my physios who has been like a dad to me, he taught me so many things. He always, always said uh, something. When you see a person with, you know, a broken leg or with cancer that they lose their hair, you, you yep. have that emotion of, oh, you know, I feel like sorry, not sorry for them, but you feel some sort of emotion towards them, which doesn't happen when you see somebody who is depressed. There's so many studies out there, but it's almost like a non discussion yeah. thing and i believe that's very brave and strong for you to be able to admit that you are struggling with something sharing that i think that takes incredible courage can you take me a little bit through that evolution for you yeah i mean look, look to go back to you know and, and again i i applaud you know your your openness and, and, and talking about it and discussing it you know, I was telling somebody before we got on the show, you know, obviously you have people of notoriety and, and celebrities on your show. And I liked you before I met you because, you know, just to have somebody, you know, I'm not I'm not a celebrity. right? I'm just a, a regular guy um, that, that that's that. Neither am I. I don't believe in that. <laughs> I don't believe in that. Well, but, you know, th to give the opportunity, because I, I think people, you know, connect, uh, you know, with with that. The first time I shared my story was on NBC Nightly News 25 years ago. 25 yeah. years ago, there wasn't anybody talking about mental health. And I ran into my tennis coach a number of years ago, and he said to me that when he saw it on NBC, his first reaction, he was scared that it would hurt recruiting, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, holy smokes, I can't even believe he said that to me. But, and he didn't say it in a bad way, but it just shows you the kind of you know stigma that is you know around this, this issue and how far you know, we've come. I mean, a day doesn't go by that somebody doesn't reach out to me, Vika, you know, with, uh, yeah. you know, my son, my, my, my husband, my father. And, and, for, and for the most part, a lot of these people are people uh, of means that um, can, can afford the best care and, and they can't figure it out and navigate the system. It leaves me thinking, you know, what, what, what shot and what chance does the regular guy have? Just two years ago, right, I was speaking at Davos at the World Economic Forum, right? And I was on my, my soapbox yelling and screaming at our world leaders, you know, listen to the subject, take it seriously. And, uh, you know, I came home two weeks later and there was a pandemic. It takes a, a major social problem, you know, and a catastrophe, you know, an epidemic uh, to make big change. And I think we have that opportunity right now. And my, my answer has always been, I'm a pretty simple guy, you know, but creativity, uh, has always been my my answer to it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It almost feels like it should be one of the most important, you know, topics because mental health, the stress that leads to your physical health, you know, not having good nutrition, all of all of those things. Why people, you know, have bulimia? That's stress that doesn't just come, you know, well, all of a sudden you you're not you're not born with it. That 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 develops more. One of the things I saw in one of your workshops was um, a girl talking about that she grew up very poor and her goal was, you know, to, to be more wealthy, that there was going to be, that's what's going to make her happy. 
And right now, sitting there, you know, painting on the shoe, she says, the goal is to be happy. And I can relate to that because being in sport is like you work so hard for a dream. And when you get it, you feel like you're going to be the most happy, you know, but that's so quickly, at least I feel like in sports, specifically in tennis, because there's week after week after week, when you win, win the match, what's the first thing that happens? You are dragged off the court to go do the interviews. You don't even have that moment to sit down and say, oh, just give me a one moment. Just give me like a little break. No, it's like, go, 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 go. For my experience, I'm sitting there and I'm talking about how I feel. And later on, I was like, I was talking complete bullshit. I was playing right after pandemic. And this was the happiest I've ever felt playing. But just being on the court gave me the biggest joy. And I kept asked, oh, what, what was the best year of your, of your career? Is it 2012 when you won? And I cannot say that because that wasn't how I felt. It, it, it doesn't surprise me. And, and it's so funny that way you're, you're talking and I appreciate it. You know, this whole thing started and you've seen the, the peace love symbol that I painted. Yeah. This symbol is, you know, you know, love in your heart and, and peace of mind. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there was the thing I was most desperate for in my life. And, you know, if people were to ask me, if you were to say, hey, Jeff, what, what gives you peace of mind? And the, the answer I would give you would surprise you. It wouldn't be some big elaborate, you know, thing. It would be, you know, having a cup of coffee with my wife without these intrusive thoughts, throwing the ball around with my, my boys, you know, uh, you know, creating, reading a book with my, my daughter. It's, it's, it's the little things in life. And people, they, you know, the world goes so fast and the pace, people don't stop for a moment and really yeah. think about, you know, what gives peace of mind. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. And what you said is perfect, right? You've won grand slams and, you know, number one in the world and all this in incredible stuff. But if someone probably said to you, you know, what gives you the most peace of mind in your life? The, the answer might surprise somebody. I did go through um, a period of my life where I, I was really struggling mentally. And I did go to a shop and I went and I bought the acrylic paints. I bought canvases. There you go. Paint with my hands. I paint with a brush. It was just, you know, pure moment of like letting go what, what you just described and explained is 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 our work and what we do yeah. right you know creativity um which you're describing uh, can be life-changing mm -hmm. in in so many different ways my paint you know but um uh, you know i don't care what you do whether it's gardening uh cooking poetry crocheting uh you know wrapping you know, writing, they're all uh, creative forms, you know, uh, but when, when in the act of creating, you, you can get lost and, and, and find some peace of mind. You know, I might not be the smartest guy in the world, but smart enough to understand that, you know, you can have the best thing in the world. If you can't get it to people, you can't help them. Then, you know, what you described is, is the, the perfect essence. What we do is not fine art, it's, it's expressive arts. And expressive arts is all about the, the, the outcome of the final product doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, it's whatever it is. And, and that's the, the victory is in doing. The single biggest question that people ask me is, Jeff, what can I do? You know, so I tell people, you know, focus on what you can do versus what you can't do. Right. You know, I, I can choose to, to work out. I can choose to journal. I can choose to, to paint. I can choose to, uh, to eat well, to do yoga. The sum of all those things sometimes, uh, you know, c can help people. Yeah. Even if it's for a few minutes, that, 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 that can be invigorating to your soul. I'm going to show you actually one of the things we did with my son. Oh, I love it. We did this with him. Love it. And I framed it. <laughs> love it. Love it. The painting that I have in my living room um, I painted with my daughter and I'll, I'll send you a, a copy of it. Oh, it's, a, it's in a gold leaf frame. It's the painting that people have wanted to buy the most. And obviously I would, I would never sell, sell it, but I, I keep the painting there for a reason, you know, yeah. cause it's, it's a reminder to me, you know, of, of, uh, you know, the impact art, you know, can have and what it can mean and being more there for my family and, and doing everything I can to, 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 you know, to be the best dad and 
father and, and son that, that I can. So it's powerful stuff, you know. Now with Leo, I realize how much the, they teach in school through paintings or through arts, you know, and it almost gets forgotten. And later on, it goes into numbers only and, you know, all the more serious stuff and physics. And it loses that, that touch of, you know, out, outlet. With Leo now, like, it's, it's more of, of opposite. Whatever he wants to do, we're like, oh, okay, let's do it. Let's explore that. Let's build, like, Legos. Let's build, you know, let's, let's use our imagination in most wild way. And I can see how much more open he is, how much... You know, um, just he, he soaks up life in so many different ways. And, and I almost kind of live that that through him. No, you're and right. I appreciate that. You're, you're right I on. I mean, my, my first uh, entree into, you know, I stumbled into all this thing. There was no script, no, no plan for you know, this journey. But, you know, when I when I first started painting, right, you know, all of a sudden people started collecting my artwork. I mean, it was ridiculous, you know, I mean, and now it's in, uh, you know, it was in you know, some galleries, private collections, next thing's at the casino, next thing it's at the Grammys, Music Cares, and people wanted to start buying my artwork, right? And I was the CEO of a company. I was embarrassed yeah. to sell my artwork, right? You know, so the co-founder of our, our, our foundation was my cousin. He offered to be my agent, right? It's yeah. stupid, right? Now, I'm, now I have an agent. And then he says to me, he says, we're going to have a one-man show for you, right? Again, ridiculous, right? Like I'm on Broadway. We're having a one man yeah. show for me. Has the show for me, comes up to me end of the night, says, You're not gonna believe this, Jeff. He sold sixteen thousand dollars of art. And he says, wow. What do you want to do with the money? And had that moment in my life, I you know, I turned to, to Matt and I said to him, you know, I said, I paint, it makes me feel better. I said, maybe it helps somebody else. And two weeks later, I literally walked into a children's psychiatric hospital that not only was I a board member of, but I was a patient. And I had a bag over my shoulder of uh, art supplies. I looked like a cross between Santa Claus and Robert. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember walking on the unit and, you know, these are other kids that had, you know, mental health, you know, uh, challenges, their families. Uh, it was heartbreaking and just told these kids my story and tried to use art as a way to challenge them to think about what gives them some peace of mind, you know, to see the impact it had on not only the children, but their parents, the docs, but most importantly, myself. It's like, you know, yeah. what in the world is going on here? You know, and it was kind of like I stumbled on something that was part motivational, part inspirational, part you can do it all wrapped into this message of hope. The language to speak to kids for me comes from me being a kid, me being a kid and hoping to have somebody that I could speak and ask questions. So I always very consciously speak with them their language, not tell them, okay, you know, you got to do this this way. You got to do it this way. You got to do that that way. It's really, it was like sharing your story and hope that they can find something that they can help them. And I think that's a very different approach from what you see a lot of times. And I, I think about how I observe information. And when somebody says, okay, you gotta do this, that, 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 and that, and I don't see them do it, I, I can't process the information that is given to me. And when somebody is sharing more kind of the story and what helped me to get there, and that's, where, that's where it's interesting. You know, I'm going to make sure that that you you participate in one of our workshops, right? Because you you oh, you would just be blown, <laughs> blown away. And, and look, we're doing this. I've watched it thousands of times. You know, our work now is impacting hundreds of thousands, and it'll be millions of people. And to this day, it still blows my mind how I can sit. I could sit with 12, 15 people. They'll share things with each other that they haven't shared with their their spouses, their significant others that. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. People open up. So how does that happen? I'm with people in 40 minutes and they're sharing stuff that they've never told anybody. And the way it happens is, you know, that there is no, there's no expectation, you know, and there's no judgment. And, and when you allow people to, to an environment where they can just, you know, speak and, and share their stories and not be judged, it's a, it's a powerful thing. And that's where empathy, 
and compassion, you know, comes from. And, you know, you mentioned one of my favorite words, authenticity, you know, um, I always like to say you can't authenticity is something you can't re-engineer. Either you got it or you don't. And people, you know, pick up on it and what you're doing and, you know, having someone like me on, on your show and, and, and talking about it openly. <laughs> Look, I, I dream big. I want to help millions and millions of people. But the truth of the matter is lives are changed one person at a time. One Absolutely. person at a time. And you just don't know. Someone will watch this and they'll, they'll see you talking about it in a, in a very authentic, non-choreographed, you know, no agenda way and say, wow. I do feel like art world can be pretty judgmental. Do you feel like that has ever been a case for you? I'm mean, the complete opposite. I'm the outsider's outsider, no judgment. When I first started, uh, Vika, I said I would start a class and I would say only, only two rules. One is have fun and make mistakes. Because the truth is that the, the outcome and the product doesn't matter. It's, it's, the, it's the process in, in doing it. If someone would have told me where my artwork would be today, given the fact I have no training. I mean, I'm wearing a yeah. pair of glasses. That's, you know, one of 60 pairs as part of a collection that a, a major chain is, is launching. I mean, I have no business, you know, doing that. And I, I share that with people because if I can do it, anybody can do it. I agree with that. I believe that everybody has their, you know, their own talents, um, their uniqueness. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do the show is to hear people's stories. Believe me, the, the stories are the stories, you know? And, and, and stories have, have the ability to mobilize the world to change. For you today, what does it mean to change the world? Bring creativity in, in, in storytelling in, in an accessible and affordable way to everybody. And we create a world that, that has a lot more empathy. You know, we, we, everybody, you know, I'm, I'm not mitigating someone that has a diagnosable mental illness like myself. But at the end of the day, we all have something on the scale, oh, yeah. on the mental health scale. Everybody's got something. We just, we, we don't live in a world where it's, where it's simply okay. It's okay to have yeah. something, you know? And what, wouldn't that be a nice world? Would you share with me maybe like really moving moments of your workshops that, that really touched you? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, could, I could go on all day, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I always like to shake everybody's hand that, that comes in, right? You know, and, uh, and, and greet them. And this, this young boy, you know, came in and, and I put my hand out and he literally ran right by me, right? And it's like, Ooh, you know, what's going on? And the therapist came up to me and, and apologized to me for this young boy and, and said that, you know, he hears things. And, um, and I said, no, he's got to apologize to me. So we started the workshop, right? And, you know, he's like this. And, you know, we're doing the workshop and, you know, all of a sudden his, his head starts to come up and next thing he's painting and I'm watching this, this, this transformation right and right, right in front of my eyes. And, you know, we got done, um, with the painting and he and I did one together. Right. And he says to me, he wanted to sell the painting so that the proceeds could be used, you know, uh, to help other kids like him do this program. What, what do you say, you know, to that? Yeah. Prisons are incredible. We do a lot of work in incarcerated populations and it is just mind boggling what goes on, the appreciation. There isn't one a day goes by or a workshop that somebody doesn't come up and, and share something and it takes so much courage and, and so much, um, you know, pain for people sometimes to share. And you see, you know, the invigoration, and, you know, how they're, they're, you know, they're not alone. I did one time programs with, um, with kids, with the UNICEF, and it was a high, high, very high rise, and I'm sure it's still happening now, which is so sad, uh, about teenagers and uh, suicide uh, with teenagers. And I've been talking to a group of, uh, of kids, and they, some of them were, they, they weren't speaking, and we started speaking through music. We started to share the music that, that we liked and why we liked this song and why, and then, you know, it just helped to open, open the space, the safe space to be able to share and the ability to get there to, to create that safe space um, for these kids was one of my favorite moments that, 
um, I had in my life. It's 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 just so powerful. I mean, I, I'm just thinking while you're talking. I just did a, I just gave a, a talk a couple of weeks ago to a corporation, and the uh, the woman was introducing me before my keynote, and mm-hmm. she broke down and cried introducing me. And it was the, oh. it was the first time I had ever had that happen, and the reason was she had a son that had mental health uh, challenges. I got up there and, you know, I told that audience, I said, you know, I'm just the, I'm, I'm, I'm just the dessert now. You've just seen, that's where it starts. You know, when our leaders are, are willing to be vulnerable like that and share, it makes it okay for everybody else. You know, it's, uh, it's powerful stuff. And every, everybody's connected to it. Doesn't miss, doesn't miss one family, right? Doesn't miss one family. I took Leo to a workshop in uh, New York, just just one of the stores they had. So we were we were painting. He did like a little lamp, and uh, my my fitness coach was sitting there with us, and he had this white shirt, and I had the paint, and I was like, and I just you know I just did this with a brush, and it like drew a line, and I was like, oh my god, I'm onto something, and I just like you know through like bunch of like paint on it and it became like an art piece <laughs> exactly that's it's it's like the superman cape you know it's my alter alter ego when i put this on it's all it's all good right yeah if it was only if it was only that easy you know? it's exactly what we talked about before it's just a moment and you kind of take it you know it's there and for me it's like okay i'm I wasn't planning doing it. I mean, I was just there with Leo. It's just like, okay, I, I lost myself in the moment. And it was it was really cool. Getting lost in the moment and finding some peace of mind describes very much, you know, our, our, our work, right? Because at, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to create uh, an organization that, you know, is, brings peace of mind and emotional well-being. For many years now, we've been training and equipping uh, frontline professionals um to take our work and, and bring it to communities you know and we've got you just here in the u.s a couple of hundred people that are all around the, the country you know frontline professionals you know social workers people at ymcas and boys and girls clubs and uh, behavioral health centers and you know colleges uh, corporations uh you know prisons that you know they they have the audience they have the community so we give them the tools to to, to bring our program and and, and now with the invent, you know, one advantage of the pandemic, the pandemic brought our per, our in-person work to a halt, you know, and, and forced us to accelerate uh, the creation of, you know, our on-demand and digital, you know, work, you know, very similar, are you, are you familiar with like Calm or Headspace? Yeah. You know, some of those, yeah. those things, right? We're developing, you know, ways that, uh, you know, people can access, you know, creativity to, to help their mental health. That's a beauty part of digital world that you're able to reach people far away and give them access. A lot of my ex-teammates, they joke that, you know, who knew I'd be better with a brush than a racket, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I tell people, I just paint what I like, right? And I, I do a lot of a lot of fashion. I do a lot of uh, 20s work. I do a, a lot of sports. And I mean, obviously, yeah. uh, you know, I've created all kinds of, of, of tennis work. Yeah, I've seen some. I've seen some. I've seen the uh, tennis balls can't live without them. The yeah. tennis cocktails, um, tennis fashion, um, the gentleman, gentleman yeah. collection. Paint yeah. what you like, you know. And, and tennis has been such a great, uh, you know, a wonderful way to to be able to kind of take what I've learned, you know, from playing, and translate that into, you know, uh, you know, some of my work. I always finish uh, my show with asking this, you know, seven questions that help me to get to know uh, my guest even even more. And if you don't mind, uh, I would love to ask you those as well. Bring it on. Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, what is your favorite word? Creativity. Okay. What is your least favorite word? Can't be done. That's three words, right? Or, <laughs> or, or impossible. Let's impossible. What is something that you would love to be able to to do? I'd like to be a uh, fashion designer. Okay. Well, with that jacket, you're halfway there. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, fourth question is one job 
in the world that you would never do? I don't think I'd want to be a politician. Oh, that's a popular answer. <laughs> that's a very popular answer. What trait from, uh, uh, from people that attracts you the most? Honesty and empathy. What is one trait that really turns you off from people? Uh, bullshit. That's a good one. And last, last question is, um, let's say that the God existed and you would have arrived at the pearly gates. What would you want the God to tell you? That it's all going to be okay. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Jeff, thank you so much for being on my show. It was such a pleasure. Again, thank you so much. And thank you for your, your vision that to have me on to talk about these important subjects and you're, I'm going to send you uh, find the jacket so that you can have okay. something to, to start making a mess on <laughs> and wishing you you know continued success you know in, in all, all all your your endeavors so thank you so much thank you it was a pleasure yeah very very proud of you thank you <laughs>